This is Dr. Lewis Blevins of Pituitary World News. Today we're discussing a patient who was thought to have acromegaly. The IGF-1 level confirmed the diagnosis. An MRI scan of the pituitary is shown here. This is the mid-sagittal section. You can see the cerebral aqueduct of Silvius, the fourth ventricle. Uh, here's the sphenoid sinus, the inside of the nose back here, back of the throat here. This is the pituitary gland, a little bit rounded on the top, but maybe some inhomogeneity here as well, but really not much going on on this scan. Here's just a slightly parasagittal section showing a uh, hypo-enhancing dark area in the pituitary gland. Here's the pituitary infundibulum. This is anterior pituitary. Over here is posterior pituitary. These little cysts between the anterior and the posterior pituitary are called pars intermedia cysts. They're benign, they don't grow, they don't require surgery. So this is not the cause of the patient's supposed acromegaly. Let's look at the coronal sections. Here's the cyst. This is the gland. We find the gland by looking for the carotid siphon. So if you cut that uh, in half, you can see two pipes. Here's one, here's the other. Carotid siphon, optic nerves up here. Visual pathways, actually, I should say. This is actually the optic chiasm. Here, I'm circling, is the pituitary gland. Down here, the sphenoid sinus. This, this hole here is the oculomotor nerve, by the way. This is one of the main nerves, there are three on each side that control eyeball movement. Um, so here's the cyst. Gland's a little bit heterogeneous here, not really anything that points to a tumor. Pituitary infundibulum is essentially midline. So it's hard to look at the scan and say you have a pituitary tumor causing acromegaly. Uh, so the point of, of showing you these scans is to illustrate uh, the benefit of dynamic contrast enhanced imaging. Now this study wasn't done the way I would want it done. Here's the pre-contrast image of the pituitary gland showing you the gland, a little bit of heterogeneity here, optic chiasm again. This is before the contrast is administered. Normally we like to do these scans serially after contrast administration. The radiologists have a protocol to basically time the scans after the administration of contrast and you get these really quick scans. So the, they're a little bit fuzzier than the normal pre and post contrast MRI studies because they're obtained very quickly. But this is the pre-scan. And then we can slice through front to back through the pituitary gland looking for evidence of tumor or other problems as we go through. I'm already starting to think there's something here. So the next image shows contrast that's already coming through the pituitary gland. And you can see here, this is bright and this is not. So I'm starting to think this is tumor here. If I change the window intensity of this scan and darken it up a bit, sorry about that. You can definitely see there's there's a tumor here that wasn't as obvious on the usual post-contrasted scan. And then you can see the cyst here. So it looks like there's a tumor here. When we go to the next MRI, it's less apparent. There's some inhomogeneity there, but it's far less apparent. And here the same, everything looks like it's equal contrast. You can see this is the same brightness as here. This is what happens. So pituitary gland enhances before a tumor does. So that we'll see, what we like to see is the tumor is dark, the pituitary is bright. If you wait long enough, or if the timing of the scan is not done correctly, you will see tumor enhancing the same as the pituitary gland. And all you see is this little tiny thing here and this tiny thing here. If you haven't seen enough pituitary MRIs, you won't recognize this is what's happened. The tumor is as bright as the pituitary gland. The capsule is not here, obviously. Uh, but then later in stages further, if you waited further in time to obtain additional MRI studies, you would see the pituitary washes out, it's going to be dark and the tumor is bright. So you have to have some skill at looking at these MRI studies, especially the dynamic contrast studies, 
to determine what's really truly going on. But I like this uh, case because it illustrates the value of looking at the scan closely, looking at the dynamic contrast enhanced images closely, applying what you see to the clinical history of the patient and making sense of subtle radiological findings. This cyst is not producing growth hormone, but this tumor over here, better seen on these images, is producing growth hormone. The radiologist missed this. This is why at a pituitary center of excellence, the pituitary endocrinologist and neurosurgeon should be the ones looking at your MRI to determine what's truly going on. Now there's one other interesting feature on this film that I'll point out to you. And that is here, the patient's calvarium or skull. The thickness of the skull here is characteristic of acromegaly. This is about double the thickness that it should be. As you know, bones grow in patients with acromegaly. One of the bones that grow is the skull and it's one of the two main causes of an increase in hat size, that being acromegaly and Paget's disease. But uh, this is a classic example of that particular finding. All right, that's enough for now. Once again, Dr. Lewis Blevins of Pituitary World News with this fine example of a microadenoma of the pituitary gland that was best illustrated after dynamic contrast enhanced imaging and also the example of a pars intermediate cyst that does not require intervention but will probably be treated or decompressed at the time of surgery to remove this pituitary tumor.